Colorado is very much an extractive industry state, coal, natural gas, some oil. And when I was a candidate, I looked at this and said, you know, we're missing this enormous opportunity as a state to also market ourselves as a state that could really move forward what I called the new energy economy. And I think I was the first person maybe to tag that line. We've Googled it. We can't find anybody else who said it before me. So we called it the new energy economy and, and believed that it was about developing um, an energy economy based on, at the time, it was kind of three principles that I called the three E's, but later uh, talked about a fourth E. As I was governor, I really became convinced there was a fourth E we needed to include. So the first of those E's was about just energy, about about diversifying the energy portfolio, about looking at how we could domestically produce energy so that we were able to do more for ourselves in domestic production, and, and that it was important that we diversified that. We thought it particularly helped us talk about our ability as a country to gain energy security. A lot of people say, you know, you're not going to get to energy independence. If we don't get to energy independence, there are ways for us to get to energy security by diversifying the portfolio. And so a big part of it was how do we aggressively produce or pursue domestic energy? And the second part, the second E, which was the clean energy part, was how do we address environmental challenges in doing this? Now, you can be a person who believes in, in human-caused climate change or not, right? I happen to be one of the people who believes in it, believes that it's happening. And it's important for us to address it. But there's a lot of public health issues apart from that that are attendant to an energy policy that, that, that should be linked. So when you're thinking about your energy policy, thinking about those public health issues or climate change, and quite frankly, they're overlapping. And so you can address those as you address a different energy policy. The third part of it for me. So it was environmental it was about your energy portfolio, and the third part of it was economic development, because I was convinced in looking around the country, looking around the world, that we could absolutely have as part of our economic development strategy, clean energy, and that in promoting clean energy, we could do what you talked about, Mr. Secretary, your ability to grow jobs, your ability to lure companies in, make companies there that are there in the state, make them bigger, and, and really increase the level of work being done in that sector. Okay, those were the sort of the three E's, and we called it the new energy economy. As governor, I added a fourth E, and that was equity, that we need to think about as we build out a clean energy policy, we absolutely have to focus on the poor people in the state. We have to focus on people who are on fixed incomes. My mom raised 12 kids. I'm one of 12 kids, right? So she has a small Social Security retirement. She lives on a fixed income. And I think of people like my mother, quite frankly, when I'm thinking about energy policy. Because there's a variety of ways to build out a clean energy agenda. But if you don't have, you know, a thought toward the rate payer as a consumer and what energy pricing can do to rate payers who are on fixed incomes and have a difficult time keeping up, then, you know, you're not thinking about it. Now, just back to sort of the climate change issue, if we don't do anything on this we impact the poor in a pretty significant way, too. Um, if you look around the world and you look to sort of where hundreds of millions of people live, there are areas that if, in fact, human-caused climate change is a part of it, and what we see are rising seas, uh, rising oceans, we see you know weather events that are cataclysmic, unlike before. There are a lot of places in the world where the poor folks who live there have nowhere to go and are going to be what we call climate refugees. But again, what I believe is as we consider energy policy, we consider energy diversification, the environment, economic development, and equity. Those were the four E's. And so I became governor in 2007, and we set about it. And the important point here is not that everything applies to North Carolina or doesn't. The important thing is, as a state, you can develop what I call an ecosystem around energy policy. You can develop an ecosystem that says we've got all the right parts in place so that we're doing all these things and we're doing them at the same time. Now, we think that an important ingredient for that is policy. An important ingredient for that is to incentivize the build out of better technology, the R&D that's happening at the university scale, but in other laboratories, private and public. 
that financing and thinking about financing, how you invest in technology, how you invest in companies that are part of a clean energy economy, how you invest in consumers being a part of the clean energy economy, that's all part of it. We call that the finance arm of it. Developing a workforce is a part of that. In our community college system, we're the first community college system in America that every community college in our state has a green job certificate so that a person can go through and have an associate's degree but at the same time get an added certificate that says you understand the world of sustainable energy. You've had this course level, this level of curricula, and we also work private companies with our community colleges specifically if the private company wants to do what they can to bring their workforce on with a different level of education, they can help set up the curricula at the community college level. So it was workforce development. And then the, the, the fifth ingredient that's very important in all this is thinking about the transmission, how you transmit electrons from one place to another. And that's a big challenge throughout the country, we know. But, but again, the five ingredients, right, the four operating principles – where that you can diversify your energy economy, that you can address environmental challenges, that you can do it in a way that inspires economic development, and that there's equity concerns built in so we're not building out energy policy on the back of the poor. But then the ingredients then are policy, technology, finance, workforce, and transmission. Those are the things you have to think about. So on the policy end of it, let's just talk a little bit about the policy end of it. For me, uh, over a four-year period, I signed 57 different bills that were clean energy bills. Now, the, the real, renewable energy standard is, is part of the story, and it's, a, it's kind of a good part of the story to tell for us because it linked policy with these other parts, right, specifically with economic development. So when I became governor, I already knew that our state had some inclination toward renewable energy because we'd had these fights in the legislature where we'd tried to pass a renewable energy standard. It continued to either get, you know, it lost in committee here or there. And so there were people in our state who said, we're taking this to the voters. In Colorado, we have an initiated process where you can put it on the ballot. And even though the major utility opposed it, we took it to the voters and it passed in 2004, it's called Amendment 37, and it said we're going to have a 10% renewable energy standard by 2015, and we're going to put in place a 2% rate cap. So that you know, the utility's not going to go more than 2%. You know, the, the rate increases can't be more than 2% for what they're building out in terms of renewables. What well, was really interesting, I became governor in 2007, and by then it was apparent that for the investor-owned utility, that's who had the, the renewable energy standard, the cooperatives, the Rural Electric Association had zero at the time. Uh, for them, they were going to get to their 10% sometime in 2008. They had to 2015. But the demand was so high, they were going to get there by the end of 2007 and 2008, and they weren't going to touch the rate cap. And so we went to the utility and we said, you know, instead of us fighting about this, let's work together and let's figure out a way to increase this and be more aggressive. And so with the utility support, we went to a 20% renewable energy standard in 2007. And we did it still within the 2% rate cap. We didn't change it. What was really interesting about doing that is that it was in the first 100 days. It had a lot of attention. And we began to see, and I'll talk about that in a minute, we began to see the economic development opportunities because we were making this clear commitment to this renewable energy standard. Now, the punchline on the renewable energy standard is last year, we went to the utility and said, you seem to be doing pretty well on this 20%. When are you going to get there? Because they had until 2020. I said, well, we're going to get there actually by 2015. And we said, what about the rate cap? And they said, no, we're going to be well below the rate cap. And so we said, can you go to 30% by 2020 and stay within the 2% rate cap? And they said, yes. And so we passed a bill last year that took us to 30% by 2020, with that 2% rate cap still in place. Now, the renewable electric associations, the municipal utilities, they have a 10% standard, and we, we put that in place in 2007. We didn't change it last year. So the investor-owned utilities, about 65%, at least 70% of the power, they are the ones that have the 30%. Again, that's very aggressive, right? For our purposes, that's a pretty aggressive standard. And you mentioned, Ward, that California is going to 33%, I think, by 2020 or 2021, so we became the second most aggressive standard, except in Colorado, what we say is Californians exaggerate, right? Can you really trust, you know, 
And the answer is, uh, we hope so. They did, they did put it in place in legislation. It was an executive order from Governor Schwarzenegger, who quite frankly was very, very, in my way of thinking, very forward thinking about the issue of energy and about the issues of clean energy. But anyway, we've become the second most aggressive standard, 30% by 2020. What's really important about this, go back to this energy diversity issue, because I also signed another bill last year that transitioned about a gigawatt of old, inefficient coal plants, very dirty coal plants. They're you know, going to have to be replaced sometime in the next 20 years, but we transitioned those to natural gas. So we went from coal to gas, and you know, there are a lot of people saying you can't do that in a state like Colorado that's such a heavy coal and oil and gas state. You can't, can't have this kind of clean energy portfolio in 2020. Uh, we're going to be at a place where we're going to have about a third coal, a third natural gas, and a third renewable in our state by 2020 because, <laughs> because we were aggressive on the policy end of it. And it is, it is important for us to sort of look at that and say, okay, so that diversifies the energy portfolio. We did it in a way that really, really will help us with a variety of environmental challenges. You know, the Environmental Protection Agency issued non-compliance letters to 37 states, including Colorado. We actually have, with our energy portfolio in 2020, we have a way to be in full compliance of the EPA standards going forward because we linked our energy policy with our climate policy or our environmental policy or however you want to call it, our emissions policy. We said we're going to do these two things together. So the question becomes, well, what's the story on economic development? Well, first of all, you have to understand, um, when I became governor, there were 275 megawatts of wind on the grid. And by the end of this coming year, there's going to be 1,800 megawatts of wind on the grid. Right? So just the build-out of those. And all, those wind farms are mostly in the eastern plains. Ibadrola is helping us build a wind farm along with Duke Energy, right? It's, a, it's the Duke Tri-State one that Ibadrola is building out. Um, but Ibadrola is part of that, that. We're building wind farms, you know, on the eastern plains. Siding's not been a big issue for us. Um, farmers in Colorado, uh, agriculture is the third biggest industry in the state of Colorado, but it survives at the thinnest margin. I'm also off of a farm. My dad was a dryland wheat farmer and a construction worker. So not a get-rich-quick scheme to begin with, to be a dryland wheat farmer in Colorado. But this industry survives at 3%, and we got farmers in Colorado with one turbine on their land. They've got $5,000 a year that they're earning in lease income. And for a farmer who has enough ground to put up 10 turbines, he's got $50,000. That's an entire income in rural Colorado for a farm family. That's really a significant thing for them to be able to do that. So there's great economic development just in sort of the build out of that, of the, of the wind. We've got great solar potential in parts of the state. That's lagged a little bit, but quite frankly is coming along and we see the same kinds of things happening in rural Colorado where solar is concerned that we've got a variety of ways for farmers to earn income that they once did not. We've got a really big wind farm on a really big spread in southeastern Colorado and it just paints the picture for you. This guy's got a hundred turbines on his land and he's only got 68 acres out of production. So that's one part of the economic development. But the other part of it, and maybe the more significant part of it when you're looking at uh, it, it, job creation, big job creation, was we were in a fight for Vestas wind turbines to move to Colorado. And when I say in a fight, we were competing with other states. And Colorado was never the state that could put cash on the barrel. We never could put money on the table because that just wasn't something we did. We lured companies there because we said it's a beautiful place. We have a really highly educated population, all these really good things. But here we're in you know, a pretty big battle with these other states Vestas is the second biggest, I think, turbine maker in the world, and they're trying to figure out where they're going to manufacture in America. And they decided to manufacture wind blades somewhere in America, and we didn't have money. Texas had money. Ohio had money. We didn't have money. We knew we were bad on these states, but we said we're going to pursue this aggressive policy agenda on clean energy. And Vestas decided to move their, their wind blade, their first wind blade plant to Colorado shortly after we made a commitment to the 20% renewable energy standard. Since then, Vestas has decided to do all of their manufacturing in Colorado, 2,600 jobs. The biggest wind tower manufacturing plant in the world is, be, is built and now operating in, in Pueblo, Colorado. So that's, that's one company, right? And you say, well, that's one company. They brought in their suppliers. So it was 2,600 Vestas jobs 
plus I think somewhere like another 500 to 600 jobs from their suppliers. There's a composite material company that moved right into their first wind blade manufacturing. So we're making wind blades, we're making the nacelles, we're making the wind towers. And that's, that's a good news story, right? But it's not just that. There's a group uh, in Germany, SMA Solar. So they make solar inverters. They'd never manufactured outside of Germany before. They decide to come to America, manufacture somewhere in America, and they choose Colorado. And they choose it, again, for a variety of reasons having to do with this ecosystem that we're building there that says we're committed to a clean energy economy. ConocoPhillips, right, an oil and gas firm, they decide to build their global research firm for renewable and alternative energy in Colorado because of this ecosystem. And they, they are just building it out now. But literally, it's going to be a couple thousand jobs, maybe more. They won't say how many, but it's thousands of jobs, and it's there because of this, this ecosystem. I want to talk a little bit about research and development because that's a really important part, and actually it's something that does translate to North Carolina. You've got fantastic you know, you have the research triangle, right? We call our research corridor for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and then Colorado State University, Colorado University, and Colorado School of Mines. We call it one of the best research corridors in the world for renewable energy. And the reason I know that is, Governor, I said that. I said it in Spain and Germany and Japan and China, and no one disagreed with me. So I continue to say it until someone says differently. That's a little joke, early morning humor. Um, but anyway, we believe that, it, that this quarter has some of the best research and development in the world, and that inspires companies. That inspires companies to come there, to move there, to want to be a part of it. So we have all these private R&D facilities. Siemens has an R&D facility. There's, a, there's a, a, a whole campus called Solar Technology, the Solar Tech Campus, with several private companies. They're sharing, sort of, they're not sharing their solar research, they're sharing the campus, but NREL comes in, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and verifies their research and sort of helping build it out. And we believe research and development, investing in it in a variety of ways, some with policy support, some with finance, is another way of building out this ecosystem on the clean energy economy. So it is about technology. It is about research and development. There's a company called Abound Solar. That's, uh, it's the story of the new energy economy in Colorado. Uh, the technology was developed at Colorado State University. And it's thin film photovoltaic. And what they believe is that their manufacturing efficiencies plus the level of technology they've been able to do in terms of the efficiency captured from the sun with the thin film photovoltaic, the combination of those two things is going to get them to what they call grid parity, meaning they, a solar company, can compete over time with wind, they can compete with coal, they compete with natural gas. And, and so they're it, at CSU, they've got this technology, and then they are trying to commercialize it. They get it commercialized, they, uh, on kind of a small scale, because the National Renewable Energy Laboratory invests some money in it. They invest $15 million in the proof of concept, but once they prove up the concept, then the VC money comes in, and they raise about $150 million in VC money, and then after that get loan guarantee money, so they're able to double the size of the operation. Now they're manufacturing in Colorado and Indiana, so we lost some of the manufacturing jobs, but you know what? That was smart for the company to do because it gave them some geographic diversification, and this company went from an idea in a laboratory hatched at a university to being a major manufacturing company for thin film photovoltaic. And they did it sort of along the way with help and support from governmental entities, but also big private money coming in because they believed in the concept once it was proved up. And that's really the story, right, of our ability as a country to move a clean energy economy forward. That's kind of the story of it, right, to do what we can to envelop to invest in the R&D part of it and then do what we can to, to ensure that the cost curve for solar is coming down. You said 50%. 50% decrease in the cost of installed solar over a four-year period. That was our experience as well in Colorado. Our utility had a renewable energy credit program that, quite frankly, uh, they didn't anticipate how quickly the cost of solar would come down, so they had to change how they did their renewable energy credits and change it pretty quickly because they said, listen, the demand for this is just skyrocketing, and we can't afford the renewable energy credit program. We're going to have to end it over the period of a year. First of all, they tried to end it in a day. Public Utility Commission said, no, not, let's not end it in a day. What's important about this is that it's not about any one thing. I've talked a little bit about the renewable side. Energy efficiency 
is a sweet spot in this entire discussion that we as a country cannot miss. Our opportunity to retrofit the built environment, our opportunity to think about energy efficiency measures as we go forward, whether we're talking about the built environment or about appliances, where we're talking about the you know, use of the weatherization money. We, we weatherized 8,000 homes last year with the dollars that were Recovery Act dollars for that purpose. Those 8,000 homes, guess what? There were low-income people whose energy costs are reduced as a result of that effort, and that's an appropriate expenditure because for our purposes, if energy does become somewhat more expensive, then at the same time, we're able to say we've reduced costs, people on fixed income, even with increased cost in energy. You say, what about the cost of energy in Colorado if you've been so aggressive about clean energy? About 15 years ago, if you looked at the cost curve, we were about 20% below the average cost of energy in uh, America, in part because we have access to pretty cheap coal. As we've been aggressive about building out clean energy, what we've found is that our cost curve has actually, compared to the rest of the country, gone down. So we're now at about 22% below the rest of the country. And so there are these good news stories to tell that have to do with economic development and job creation, but also we've been able to do this in a way we believe that really protects the rate payer. And we've been mindful about that along the way. And we've been able to say to the naysayers, no, we're going to demonstrate that we can do this. And we've been incremental about it. We didn't try and bite it all off in one full, you know, fell swoop. We said we're going to do this incrementally. We went from 10%, 20%, 30%. We did it with the same rate cap in place along the way. And so it's this important thing to understand, right, that you can do this. You can build out this clean energy economy. You can do it in a way where you protect the four E's, where you have all the right ingredients, but it, it involves people working together on a consensus basis. When we passed our 30% renewable energy standard, we had you know, a group of folks at the table that involved sort of the, 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 the uh, manufacturing world, that involved you know, the folks who were involved in renewable energy, but also people on the energy efficiency side and the utility and what we would call the environmental community. When we passed this other bill we called Clean Air, Clean Jobs, it had to do with the transition from coal to natural gas. We had natural gas producers and environmentalists sitting down at the table for really one of the first times. And for us, it was about bringing in as many people as we could, sitting them down and saying, here's our desire. Here's where we want to get to. Can you help us think about how to get there so that we, when we go to policymakers, we've got bipartisan support which we did on the coal to natural gas. We had bipartisan support. Our first renewable energy standard, when we put it on the ballot in 2010, the co-chairs were pretty prominent Democrats and Republicans who said, for us as a state, this is a good thing. I can't say everything that I did was bipartisan. There were some things that absolutely broke down along partisan lines. One of the most important things, as I conclude this morning, uh, one of the most important things that we need to think about in this country, how do we build out this clean energy economy? How do we do it in a way that promotes energy security? And how do we do it where we take the politics out of it? That we sort of neutralize the politicization that can happen around this issue. And think really about an energy future that's 20 or 30 or 50 years off. But think about it in a way where it's not about partisan politics. It's not about you know, who wins and who loses, but how we as a country can aggressively move in a direction that says our children will consume and produce energy differently than we did because we paid attention to this issue and because we paid attention to it knowing that it would have this positive impact on them. But really at the end of the day is this win, win, win where the environment, where energy diversification, and where economic development is considered. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thanks for an opportunity to speak, and I also will take some questions.